Okay. So welcome again. So um, let me introduce myself. My name is Erkan. I'm one of the program director, in extremism and populism in ECPS. Uh, ECPS is an uh, European Center for Populism Studies. It is an independent nonpartisan uh, research organization in, based in Brussels. Uh, so we cover different aspects of the populism from global south to the north. Uh, especially, uh, we look at the populist tendencies, uh, authoritarian tendencies, which become nowadays uh, visible in every uh, continent, in every uh, country. And we want to give a focus on to analyze, to understand, and to address also how we handle this populist and authoritarian uh, tendencies. Um, so I will be very short. So if you want to find much more details about the uh, ECPS, you may find every information, about, especially about the research groups that we have uh, in our organization uh, on our uh, webpage. And this panel series is one of the uh, aim to understand correctly uh, where we move uh, from because populism is not a new, so it's already exist, but maybe we have different phases of this populism from Eastern Europe to the South, to the North, or in other part of the, 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 of the globe. And we have different uh, um, experts, uh, many um, researchers and scholars uh, now are going to give a talk about this uh, specifically uh, Eastern uh, European uh, case studies that we will uh, today. Um, if you want, I want to just introduce um, Professor uh, Dobek Ostrovska, you, and then you present other people. I think it's better, but it's up to you. Uh, professor Dobek Ostrovska is a full professor at the Institute of the Political Science at the Uni University of Wroclaw in Poland. Uh, she is founder and editor of the Central European Journal of Communication uh, that I already um, read many articles from um, that journal. And sh she is also president of the Polish Communication Association. She has many- Was, many was. Was, <laughs> okay. <laughs> In any case, uh, maybe you are the honorary, you are the honorary president of Polish, uh, the Polish Communication Association. Uh, so you, you may have wonderful um, research articles. Uh, so welcome again for this uh, wonderful panel. The floor is yours, Professor. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you very, very much. Above all, I would like to thank the European Center for Populism Studies for the invitation. It is the, the great honor for me to be with uh, you today and to, to share our knowledge with uh, the participants. But uh, please uh, let me start with a few sentences dedicated to the very sad uh, situation which happened uh, in Ukraine today morning. At I all time, all day, I watch TV and I observe uh, the, 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 the development of, uh, of the war, uh, of the war uh, in Ukraine. Uh, you know, uh, it is uh, really very, very sad for us. And uh, uh, we are very afraid uh, about this situation. Uh, I would like to show you the book of my friend, a very good friend uh, from, uh, she is Ukrainian, Natalia Ryabinska, professor uh, who works in Warsaw University, but uh, she is from Kharkov and uh, um, uh, her family lives in Kharkov. And as you know, Kharkov was bombarded uh, today uh, morning. Uh, so it is really a very, very difficult situation. So uh, I think that um, 24 uh, February uh, 2020, we will have in our hat, not only because it is the day of our, of our panel, but above all, it is the first day of the, um, of the work. Okay, 
so uh, I would like to tell that all Poles are with uh, Ukrainians and we support uh, them strongly during uh, this uh, very difficult time. Okay, so but it is a time uh, for the uh, for our um, uh, uh, panel populist authoritarian tendencies populist authoritarian tendencies in Eastern and Central Europe and challenges in the European Union. We have uh, uh, four participants uh, from uh, uh, professors from Poland, uh, Dominika Kasprowicz, uh, Zoltan Adam uh, from Corvinus University of Budapest, uh, yes, and uh, Vasilis, um, uh, we, who uh, will present us the situation in Croatia and Serbia. And after that, uh, Miroslav Maresz uh, from Masaryk University. Uh, so welcome, and uh, I'm really very happy to have you on the screen. I, I prefer, I, I uh, would prefer uh, to have you in the real, um, but what to do? We live uh, in the uh, pandemic uh, time. Okay, uh, so. I would like uh, to show you my presentation. I don't know uh, if it would be possible. Do you see it? Do you see it? Yes, no. we can see it. Yes? Yes, you do. Okay, okay. Uh, so, um, above all, because um, the, 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 the uh, our uh, presentation uh, is dedicated to populist authoritarian tendencies, okay? Uh, so the next uh, one, it is a problem. What does mean authoritarian populism? And uh, what does mean Central and Eastern Europe in a geographical and political sense uh, context? Because uh, uh, sometimes so we think about the Central and Eastern Europe in a different um, context. Okay, uh, so the next one, uh, it is the uh, it is the 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 uh, the, the um, uh, uh, definition of authoritarian um, authoritarian populism. What does that mean? Uh, it is cynicism. It is ideology, political ideology, whose uh, and this ideology is um, uh, 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 defined as uh, the cynicism uh, about human rights, hostility to the state. The next one, it is opposition to immigration. And the third one, it is an enthusiasm for a strong defense and a foreign uh, policy. And this term started to exist in political science, um, thanks to Reagan and Thatcher uh, when they came to power. Authoritarian, authoritarian populism was a term of academic, uh, academic uh, uh, use it, uh, uh, to describe their politics. So, of course, you could use, uh, you could uh, find this uh, um, uh, this uh, definition uh, in uh, internet without any problem. But now. I would like to show you how many books um, are presented, uh, are dedicated to, uh, to, uh, to, to populism. I think that uh, in Poland, we have one specialist who is with us because uh, Dominika is one of the specialists um, uh, uh, she uh, published uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, book and article dedicated to populism. Uh, the book Popul Pop Populist uh, Political Communism Across Europe, Context and, uh, um, Context and Contents. And Dominika is one of the author uh, here. And the second one, it is the Central European Journal of Communication, which is uh, dedicated to populism and the media across Europe. And uh, um, also we could uh, find the very in interesting uh, um, uh, interesting uh, article uh, and Dominica uh, uh, presented uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the the chapter the, the article here also. It is the first one, populism, authoritarian populism, okay? And uh, uh, the next one, uh, it is uh, the, uh, the, 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 the next one, uh, it is, uh, uh, it is like that. Uh, okay. Uh, look, uh, uh, it is the the article of uh, Dominica. And now the second part of the um, second part of my um, introduction. It is what does mean Central and Eastern Europe? Okay. What does mean? 
um, uh, because in geographic uh, sense, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, three Baltic states, uh, Pol Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Slovenia, Croatia, Romania, uh, but also Belarus, uh, also Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine, also Moldova, also Romania, Bulgaria, and post-Yugoslavian countries, okay? Uh, so uh, Balkan states and post-Soviet Union states, okay? So I think that in the context of the war in the Ukraine, Ukraine, it is very, very important. But uh, today uh, we uh, have uh, um, uh, rep, uh, the participants from uh, from uh, some countries. Above all, Poland. But uh, we have colleague from uh, from Estonia. But uh, the presentation will be dedicated to um, Serbia and uh, Croatia. We have colleague from. Uh, Czech Republic, and we have colleague from Hungary. Okay, so I think that it is really very, very important. How I think that uh, thanks to you, we could discover, we could know more about the authoritarian populism in your uh, country. Okay, so it is like that. Okay, so what about my main question? Uh, my question: What does mean authoritarian populism versus the quality of democracy? because I think that authoritarian populism, we should link and we should uh, analyze in the context of quality of democracy in CE. And also the second one, it is authoritarian populism versus mass media freedom, how it works, okay? Uh, so the next, um, slide, I show you uh, where we have uh, four uh, models of the uh, po po political uh, and media system in Central and Eastern Europe, okay, hybrid uh, liberal where Estonia is, uh, it is the highest uh, uh, country, the first on the position, Czech Republic, but also politicized media, Poland, Croatia, Hungary, and Serbia, okay, uh, so it is like that, and the, the next, uh, 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 the next uh, a slight politicization of media system in the Central and Eastern Europe according to WordPress freedom. And to look, Czech Republic is in the group of the best democracies in Central and Eastern Europe. Poland, Serbia, Hungary, Croatia are in the middle part of this light. And the next one, look, it is the 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 uh, the, the, I, I show it you the country's uh, uh, democracy index in 2021 and press freedom index 2021 and look Czech Republic, it is in the uh, group, uh, the, the highest uh, uh, level, uh, but look, uh, the, the, the situation in Czech Republic is less uh, uh, in, in compare, uh, if we compare it with the uh, one year and three year ago. After that, it is Poland, Croatia, Hungary, Serbia, okay? But if we think about the press freedom index, Czech Republic has a relatively high position, but not the highest, okay? After that, Croatia, Poland, and look, Hungary and Serbia are in the very, very, they have a very bad uh, position. And the next one, it is uh, my question, okay? Uh, about, uh, uh, could you go to the next uh, slide? Okay. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, I have uh, two questions. Do populist authoritarian tendencies exist uh, in the CEE? It is the first one. Authoritarian tendencies, populist. If yes, uh, are they uh, strong? What about the populist uh, authoritarian tendencies in Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, uh, uh, Croatia, and Serbia? So I think that it is a time now for uh, for uh, for the, the, the main presenters, and I think that we can start with Poland, and um, uh, I think that uh, uh, that Dominika uh, can tell us about the Polish situation. Dominika, welcome. Thank you very much, Madam Professor, and uh, distinguished colleagues. I hope you hear me well. Uh, yeah. My name is Dominika Gasprowicz. Uh, I work at the Jagiellonian University and after uh, researching the phenomena of the political populism for the last 10 years, 
Recently, I turned and uh, according with my, uh, with my colleagues, alongside with my colleagues, I turned my attention to understanding of the populist phenomena in the framework of communication or and media studies. This is something I want to elaborate on a bit later, but first of all, let me address the topic of a day. Unfortunately, uh, as it has been mentioned by Professor Dobek Ostrowska, today is an important uh, and unfortunate Unfortunately, unprecedented day when the Russian um, troops uh, entered and invaded the, our neighboring country, Ukraine. And that marks, unfortunately, a, a historical uh, moment in our current uh, foreign and domestic affairs. I would like to express how much sorry, but also how much empathetic I am. We are as academic community, as the Jagiellonian University scholars, as scholars all around the world, I believe, with our colleagues and friends in Ukraine. We feel obliged to stand Alongside with you, we feel obliged to convince the allies uh, from all around the world to assist the Ukraine uh, to keep its independence. Otherwise, we would not be discussing as scholars the phenomena of uh, authoritarian populism tendencies. But unfortunately, I believe we will need to discuss the uh, praxis of it uh, throughout Europe every, every day. Um, but let me get back to the topic. Uh, this is the authoritarian populist tendencies. Um, uh, we cannot speak about the, uh, the tendencies, uh, authoritarian tendencies uh, in the Polish case anymore. You are all perfectly aware of the fact that uh, since 2015, uh, we are observing a, a progressing and very radical political cultural and social change that is happening not only in Poland, but also alongside the region. The change that has been dictated and designed by the mindset that we, that we can easily uh, address as a populist one. So all the um, all the theoretical frameworks, all the theoretical features that we normally teach as the one that distinguishes the populist phenomena, are there are here actually. So uh, the um, claim to the people the anti-elitistic rhetoric, the radical tactic in terms of pursuing the political change. We see it, we experience it, and uh, uh, at this point, uh, we do not have much of an alternative for it. When turning into the communicative um, uh, aspects of the, of the populism, I realized that uh, for us scholars, for us publicists as well, um, and for us citizens, it offers an alternative and quite in-depth, um, let's say, framework to, to work with the uh, everyday political practice, practice of Poland, but also of other countries. Why? Because uh, unlike uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, when the populist studies were developing. Um, now the populist communicate is actually very visible, but also very influential on large scale. Uh, just to remind you about the research that has been done, quite a big comparative international research that has been done in 2019 with colleagues from other 11 countries. We are trying to assess the impact of the populist communication online uh, in the, on the internet, especially during, uh, with a use of social media. So to make, uh, to to make the very long story short, uh, the, the results were very um, moving. Uh, just to remind you about uh, the fact that only when the online the social experiment has been conducted with a stimuli that was pretending to be a very simple, very typical populist message, the outcome, the result of this research was uh, of the uh, aspects in terms of their knowledge, in terms of their um, readiness to act, so the behavioral aspect as well. 
this was the research uh, that has been done on not a representative but quite a large uh, sample of over one uh, uh, 16,000 uh, um, uh, respondents and has been described in the book that was uh, mentioned by Boguslava later. Uh, and it, it took uh, us three years actually to be at this point, but it also, um, but it, it holds in holds and it stands in a sense that uh, that uh, we know that the that the tendencies of the mass communication of the political communication uh, actually go uh, very in line in what uh, uh, works in favor of the populist in the office. Uh, this is as to the uh, as to the populism understood as communication uh, style and praxis. When getting back to the Polish case, of course. I am sure you are all aware of the ongoing political developments in Poland and the fact that the very carefully designed, I believe, political radical uh, change that started a few years ago by the Law and Justice Party has almost, has almost been concluded. Um, all three features of the populist uh, appeal of the populist ideology, if you like, uh, were the in place. Uh, what actually is uh, in contrast to what the scholars would uh, expect is actually the fact that this party, this populist uh, party, is still in power and the popular mm, support for it is not so much uh, uh, decreasing. Uh, why it's uh, possible? Of course, uh, there are uh, plenty of uh, direction when we can find an, a partial answer to this question, to this phenomena. But let me turn your attention to at least two points. Of course, populist and law and justice party in Poland is one of the examples, is appealing to uh, the people and this appeal in the Polish case has proven to be uh, extremely efficient. It was uh, because um, the Law Justice Party message was actually filling in the niche, filling in the void that has been laid by the neoliberal or liberal central centrist parties um, uh, that were governing before. There were uh, quite of a, a big share of the population that has been, let's say, left behind. So-called losers of transformation was a very fertile ground to receive and to flourish on the a background given by the Law and Justice Party in terms of their message. But it also uh, goes uh, in line with the political praxis. So the, the so-called welfare chauvinism we know from the books, but actually that proven to be very efficient in case of the, of the Polish uh, population and the Polish scenario. What we uh, understood and understand by the welfare chauvinism, of course, is this a very picky a philosophy of who is uh, actually good enough to be subsidized with the public money. And if you look into the layers of this welfare chauvinism, actually, that is in, in ongoing in, in the Polish case, you see that it happens in all and every aspect of the important spheres of public and uh, mm, mm, internal domestic life. Just to give me an example of the uh, NGO sector, the civic organizations, civil society organizations, as you know, this was a quite large and diverse arena of activism in the last 25 years in Poland. If you look into the number, you would see a, a, a decreasing number of this organization, basically, because uh, in the last few years, the public money debt, unfortunately, was uh, one and only for many cases, uh, a reason, uh, not a reason, but a fuel uh, to, to keep these NGOs going, actually was cut off. Of course, it has been this arena of the NG, so-called NGO grassroots organization has been gradually supplemented by the new ones that are more in favor of the public eye. But uh, mm, uh, if you think of uh, this aspect of the so-called welfare chauvinism, it, it's one of the examples I feel that can be read as very, as very efficient. If you think of the welfare chauvinism, you can look into the numbers, into the financial 
financial finances into the budgets of an average Polish uh, household. Uh, and you see, if you, if you would look into one and uh, into a gradual economic reforms or social reforms that has been implemented by the government, you would understand that they were not only carefully designed in terms of the public spending and, and balancing the budget at all, it were more designed and oriented towards the particular target groups, the strong social strongholds that are the most highly likely to be the Law and Justice Party and its allies, uh, biggest supporters and electorates in the, the, the past, but also the forthcoming the forthcoming um, uh, elections. If you think of the welfare chauvinism as a distinctive feature and how it has been translated into the Polish everyday, everyday lie, you would also see uh, the um, uh, maybe not so much uh, financial, but uh, very much practical orientation or anti-immigrant orientation I have in mind. So welfare chauvinism means uh, that uh, only the part of the Polish society, the people, the of course the pure and uh, the uh, the the almighty people is good enough to be getting not only the attention but also the public funds. It translates also into the second feature of the populist we know uh, that it means uh, and it, mm, con mm, focuses on the on the creation of the of the other, of the enemy. And if you look on the very, very long, it seems never ending list of the enemies of the currently governing uh, um, the political uh, elite in Poland, it's, uh, you will very uh, shortly understand that this is a uh, this is a, a quite, uh, I would say, not only efficient, but also interesting phenomena, because what we are used to is the fact that the populist parties and populists are targeting and are against the ruling elites. In the Polish case, actually, the ruling elites were the past uh, ruling elites, that those who were there before. Uh, these were the European elites, so the European Union as such, European Commission, and especially the judicial system of the European Union, so the pan-national one. Uh, but uh, the, the group of the others, the group of the uh, mm, mm, alleged uh, mm, uh, enemies of the people were also the a phantasmatic e-commerce uh, uh, in the case of in the case of uh, immigrants not all immigrants because polish society and also polish government is uh, very highly likely to receive and accommodate the closest ones the culturally closest ones so i'm saying about the belarusians i'm saying about ukrainians to some extent but if you look into the inflow of the uh, representatives of other religions or more di distinct um, uh, distance countries, uh, especially Syria, especially Iraq. So those who are now blocked, still blocked in the so-called reception centers, it's the estimated number for last week was 3000 people that are in the in between uh, um, waiting in most of the cases to be deported back to the countries of the origin. Uh, but this is also the group, uh, the group that has been uh, that has been very efficiently targeted. If you look back uh, five years, uh, you see that the um, that these were just the artificial fears that were fueled by the uh, by the message of the um, populist radical right party in uh, in power. Uh, if you look into the into the recent developments at the polish Russia border, you would, you would see that again, this topic at first, at least at first, has been fueling the pro-governmental sentiment. When we think about the, um, the, another feature of the, um, of, uh, of the populism and its current um, um, emblems, current examples in the Polish case, we need to also uh, look into the authoritarian tendencies and the so-called charismatic leadership and the so-called, not the so-called, but the, uh, the turn into the non-democratic uh, praxis that has been taken uh, on behalf of the very democratic uh, 
uh, background, so the vox populi, the, the people. And again, uh, uh, and again, if you uh, if you uh, look into the examples, uh, we uh, we have heard already. Uh, Bogusława showed us the indexes, the few examples of the indexes that speaks on its own when it comes uh, to the scope of liberal uh, uh, re liberties and freedoms. It looks into the uh, uh, the diminishing um, balance of three powers in the Polish case. Uh, all that together, of course, I could continue with examples, but maybe we will leave it for the discussion um, to make uh, it all together uh, uh, into, into, uh, into one a sentence uh, um, when I started, uh, let me be very personal now, like uh, uh, let me speak from my own individual perspective. Um, when I, uh, as a young scholar, uh, decided to dig into this uh, uh, large scholarship dedicated to the uh, populist radical right, uh, in Poland, it was the early 2000s, we have had a fringe uh, parties of uh, um, League of Polish Families and the so-called self-defense that closely shared the fate of many of the populists who were kept on the margins of the mainstream politics. Ten years later, uh, we are not, uh, 20 years later, <laughs> we are not anymore speaking about the fringes of the politics, we are speaking about the mainstream of the politics, but we are also speaking about uh, handling and dealing with this development that already has uh, resonated and uh, caused a radical and I would say irreversible social uh, change. Uh, when I look back in, uh, into my early years in academia, my uh, and when I remember these questions about so what's behind the status of the populist radical right in the democratic representative democratic liberal systems, what's 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 what would makes the difference? That at that point the main thing, the the most important answer was it is the attitude, it is the decision of the mainstream parties. It's not even about the the, the uh, electoral support. It was all that time about the mainstream parties. Uh, now, as uh, scholars, and this is a kind of challenge I would like to you challenge with at the end of my uh, very short and very speedy speech. Um, and we are facing a quite uh, important challenge as scholars, but also as practitioners uh, and as civilians, as, as uh, citizens. Uh, we are not speaking about the uh, the the actions uh, uh, taken up by the mainstream politics because the mainstream politics is something that we are handling with we are uh, now opening a new chapter and uh, i'm posing this question without an answer from my side yet how to handle the mainstream politics in the para-democratic systems uh, uh, that has been uh, uh, invaded uh, that has been populated by the populist radical uh, radical right. Thank you very much. Uh, Boguslava, you have to open mic microphone. Microphone, please. Okay, now, thank you, thank you very, very much, Dominika. And uh, now it is a time to go to uh, to uh, to Hungary. And uh, um, the Orban regime, after twelve years after the April twenty twenty two general election, and uh, Zoltan, welcome. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. It's a great pleasure of mine to be here. Of course, I I, I agree with Bogislava that this is a very sad day. Uh, indeed, yeah. in the world history, I would say, and definitely in the European uh, part of the world, we are watching um, with uh, great fear, I guess, uh, what's going on in Ukraine. So, so I just would like to express my own solidarity towards all those who are being in danger right now uh, on the other side of the border. Actually, today, Hungary is, is, is once again a country uh, one of its uh, uh, neighbors are waging a war. Uh, that was a, 
in, in the 1990s, that was the case during the Yugoslavian wars. And now one, once again, we, we have, so to speak, war in next door, which is quite a dramatic development. Um, okay, so let's turn to, to populism. And, uh, and I just want to say that uh, I, I, I'm very honored to be here and I'm, I'm, I just would like to welcome the, the existence of this research institute. I think it's a great development that you guys did set it up. Uh, and I'm personally very grateful to be invited to, to, to be part of this project. So thanks a lot. And at this point, I try to share my screen. So I, I'm talking about Hungary, obviously, which is actually a pretty prominent case of populism. As we know, uh, Mr. Orban, our prime minister since uh, 2010, uh, is kind of a uh, you know world stage actor in the drama of populism. And on a regular basis, he meets with uh, uh, well leaders of the populist world, or I should rather say the autocratic world, um, uh, and uh, he also. Uh, likes to associate with the leaders of the European far right. And it seems that he also makes an impact on Central and Eastern European fellow populists. So in that sense, although I of course do not want to exaggerate the importance of my own country, but in that sense, uh, what's going on in Hungary uh, may have been making some impact on the uh, Fundings of, of Hungary, as well as on, to some extent at least, uh, maybe uh, in a wider context as well. So Hungary is, a, is an example, is an example of populism. But what is populism? There are varying uh, definitions for the world, and uh, various scholars mean uh, different uh, notions by the word populism. I personally uh, tend to opt for the Finkelstein definition. Federico Finkelstein is an Argentinian uh, historian, uh, one of my favorite authors uh, on, on the uh, scholarship of populism. And he calls populism a form of authoritarian democracy for the post-war world. And, and this is important because in his historical scholarship, he makes a, a link actually between fascism and populism in the sense that populism, he argues, is a kind of modern day reincarnation or kind of de de democratic reincarnation of fascism in the sense of it has a totalitarian approach to power. So populists are those politicians, political parties and political leaders who exhibit a kind of majoritarian or even a totalitarian uh, vision when they conduct power. Uh, as we know, one of the key characteristics of, of populism is the diminishment of, of uh, uh, liberal democratic institutions. Uh, the, uh, those institutions which could uh, defend minorities, political minorities, ethnic minorities, any sort of social minorities, as opposed to the majority. So limit the concept of limited government being eliminated by populists. And in that sense, Finkelstein argues uh, populism is, is a political system in which those uh, liberties provided for minorities in a democratic society are increasingly endangered or eliminated. And I believe what we are witnessing in the world is, is the elimination of, of liberties. Uh, in some cases, it goes to an extreme extent when an originally popularly elected politician like Vladimir Putin uh, uh, becomes a true autocrat, a dictator who eliminates, uh, eliminates freedoms, not only in his own country anymore, as he did before. Uh, you can think about the incarceration of his political opponents, uh, but also in other countries by now, uh, very openly and explicitly. So this is my concept of, of populism I'm, I'm working with. And there are three characteristic, characteristics Finkelstein points out the cultivation of highly personalized political leadership. So populist leaders all, always exhibit uh, personalized political leadership. They are all, always charismatic leaders who, who, who themselves uh, dominate the, the political system. They tend to extend social rights. That's very important. That's the way uh, they gather political support. And I think the Polish case we just heard about speaks for that. 
and at the same time they tend to constrain to limit and at the extreme to eliminate the, the political rights the political freedoms uh, their population uh, used to enjoy okay so let's have a look at hungary in that context so victor orman's hungary since 2010 is a prime example of that actually he had been in power between 1998 and 2002 so this was already the second spell of orban that was started in 2010 uh, back in 1998-2002 he did not, did not have something which he, he has had since 2010 the two-third majority of parliament uh, i will talk a little bit uh, about the hungarian political system uh, in in the coming slides uh, what i would like to emphasize now is that once one political party or a political coalition of parties controls two-thirds of the seats in the single chamber Hungarian parliament, that majority can basically do anything. There are no more constitutional constraints on that. They can introduce kingdom or, or you know, they can, they can rename the country to Orban land or whatever they want to do, they can do. There is no institutional constraint. Hungary's EU membership does uh, pose some institutional constraints uh, on the government. And as a consequence of that, the conflict between the Hungarian government and the EU Commission or various bodies of the European Union uh, are a recurring phenomenon in the past decade. But apart from that, uh, there is no domestic authority that, that is not controlled by, by the governing majority. And this is a ripe the land, the ripe soil, so to speak, for this kind of totalitarian approach uh, to power populists tend to exhibit. Uh, as a consequence of that, Hungarian democratic standards have been steadily declining in the past decade. And I can show you some graphs of, on that. On the left hand side, you see the Freedom House uh, uh, world aggregate scores for the quality of democracy. You see a market decline since 2014 and and actually uh, a decline already before that uh, and on the right hand side you see the vdem the varieties of democratic institutes uh, libdem variable which also exhibits a market decline for hungary uh, the other lines are aggregates of uh, groups of central and eastern Euro european countries so the baltic trees the three baltic countries uh, average the c4 is the average of the czech republic slovakia uh, Slovenia and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, those uh, uh, include the Polish one. Sorry, of course, uh, the, the the fourth the fourth one is the Polish, and the C three is the Croatian, uh, Romanian, and Bulgarian. So against these benchmarks, against these comparators, Hungary exhibits market decline in its quality of democracy. Uh, you can also compare. A, country's democratic development or the quality of its democracy to its economic level of development. Uh, and this is what I did on these uh, slides. I, I constructed the scatter plots, uh, 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 you know, examining the, the, uh, the, the relationship between uh, 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 per capita GDP at PPP standards, uh, taking the log scales on the horizontal axis and the VDAM Liberal Democracy Index on the vertical axis. axis. And what you can see is that uh, whereas Hungary was above the trend line, so performed uh, politically in terms of its democratic qualities better than one could ex expect, uh, given the, the global trend, trend line, this is a global trend line, up until 2010. After 2010, the last elections took place in 2018, so I picked 2018. It fell below the trend line. So compared to Hungary's economic level of development, Hungary underperforms uh, in terms of its democratic qualities. Um, and why is that? Uh, one can one can ask. Uh, in what sense Hungary is different? But of course, this is a very complex issue, and I cannot give you a full answer to that question. Actually, I do not know a full answer to that question. Of course, I'm not that smart. But one characteristic uh, of Hungary that is kind of suspicious in that, in that context, I would argue, is the exclusive nature 
of the Hungarian political system. So this is what I referred to when I said that with a two-third majority, you can do anything in Hungary. And actually, you can attain a two-third majority at Hungarian elections. So if you do not have strong opponents uh, with a simple majority, so the Fidesz received 53% of the overall vote back in 2010, and about 46% in 2014, and, and, and a slight, little less than 50% in 2018. And all three times, uh, it was translated into two thirds of the majority of seats in parliament. So, so that's, that's one, one very important uh, element of the story. And, and why is that? Well, the, what I, I sh show you here now is the so-called Gallagher index. The Gallagher index measures the discrepancy between votes received and parliamentary seats. Uh, controlled by particular political parties, the Hungarian electoral system exhibits a very high degree of this kind of discrepancy. It's a, it's a distortion, highly distortionary electoral system, and, and that, 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 is, that is an important part, uh, or potentially at least seems to be an important part. It's more distortionary than any other, uh, any other political uh, electoral system. Our prime minister is a kind of uh, hero of global populism, I also discussed the Finkelstein definition of populism, and I told you that uh, having a two-third majority in Hungarian parliament means quite a lot. I also uh, discussed the declining democratic performance of Hungary in terms of Freedom House Index and VDEM, uh, Liberal Democracy Index, and I uh, discussed the relationship between economic development and the quality of democracy, and I said that in that respect, Hungary has fallen a lot uh, to, uh, in the 2010s. Uh, I said that one of the potential explanatory factors behind this kind of unique performance of Hungary is a, is a feature of, of the Hungarian political system, namely the exclusive nature, the distortionary nature, I, I would say, of the Hungarian electoral system, which, which uh, permits one dominant political party to control uh, two thirds of, of, the, of, of, of the parliamentary seats in extreme situation. And it actually did happen throughout the 2010s, also using a kind of manufactured electoral system by uh, this majority. This is the so-called Gallagher index. And you can see on the right that Hungary has increased in that distortionary mess uh, of a, its electoral system throughout the 19, uh, towards the 2010s. Uh, I was to compare, uh, the old style economic populism that prevailed before 2010 and exhibited by the Hungarian left with the right wing, increasingly authoritarian way of populism that Fidesz exhibited after 2010. I will not do that now because I don't have time for that. Uh, I, uh, I was also uh, to compare Fidesz and Jobbik. Jobbik was the old right wing radical. Uh, political party in Hungary. By now, it has become a kind of mainstream uh, right, mi middle right, center right party, whereas Fidesz gravitated towards the radical right pole, meanwhile. Uh, and I, I was to discuss Fidesz performance in government in terms of economic policies. I will not do that. Uh, what I just want to say uh, is that uh, there's a kind of a, uh, interesting situation politically now in Hungary. So if you look at these two guys, these are two opposition political leaders. The, on the left-hand side, you see the Budapest mayor. And on the right-hand side, you see a guy called uh, Peter Markizoy, who is the elected uh, candidate of the joint opposition or the united opposition. So the opposition now, realizing this distortionary nature of the Hungarian electoral system came up with a coordination mechanism, had primaries uh, last September and October, and this guy on the right won uh, the primary. And uh, what we have now is this situation in which actually first time since 2008, actually, uh, the opposition of Fidesz has a chance of beating uh, Mr. Orban at a national election, which is coming up in April. Um, thanks a lot. That was my presentation. 
Thank you, thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, Hungary is a very significant uh, um, uh, uh, casus. Uh, and thank you for, uh, for, for the interesting knowledge. And now let's go to the uh, post-Yugoslavian area, to Croatia and Serbia, scanning the far right in Croatia and Serbia. Vasil is welcome. Uh, uh, thank you. you. I'm trying, I will try to, uh, I will try to, to uh, yes, I found my document i will try to to yes. upload it as as uh, promptly as possible so can so, so without any further delay i will uh, i would prefer in order to save time i think that i can can start with my uh, presentation which is scanning the far right in croatia in serbia and uh, croatia and uh, my two main questions in uh, my two, two main questions in this uh, in uh, my, my two, two main questions in this uh, presentation is first, why are the parties of the nominally radical and extremist right in Serbia and Croatia weak? And second, how has the engagement of the governing parties, meaning in Serbia, the nominally center-right Serbian Progressive Party or SNS, and in Croatia, the nominally uh, center-right party of HDZ or Croatian, uh, Nas uh, 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 or Croatian National Union has impacted on the poor performance of the radical and extremist uh, rights. And starting with a little bit of theory, I would like to make uh, a distinct, a tentative distinction between radical and extremist right, right wing uh, parties on the basis mainly of their political origins and active political uh, engagement. So, on the one hand, I would like to make, uh, I have sketched out two categories. The one of them is uh, the radical right wing parties, which I tend to see largely as uh, uh, cadre parties uh, that have come into existence out of the uh, out out of the uh, the merger or or uh, the merger or other, uh, of uh, pre-existing parties or uh, uh, and uh, therefore as the products of top level top level for measure processes which uh, in the long run have also uh, have also participated in coalition governments in their uh, uh, respective countries and some examples of that are the parties for example of uh, ECRE here in Estonia or the party of the Sweden Democrats in uh, Sweden. And on the other hand, I would like to sketch out the category of the extremist right-wing parties, which are often represent the culmination of bottom-up formation processes. They are, they are more prone to, uh, uh, to a militant uh, uh, engagement into politics uh, uh, through mass mobil uh, systematic uh, mass mobilization and uh, a pattern of patterns of policy making that often harbor uh, anti-democratic uh, implications and some examples uh, can be, for instance, uh, the uh, early Jobbik in Hungary, uh, the party of our Slovakia, Nasia Slovensko, uh, led by uh, Marian Kotleba, or, or also the case of Golden Dawn in uh, Greece. But what needs to be stressed here is that uh, the parties of the radical right tend to scrutinize liberal democratic constitutional order, but overall they respect, uh, they formally respect democratic institutions and procedures, while the parties of the extremist right, they tend to antagonize liberal democratic constitutional order, and uh, they uh, and uh, they can also be guilty of uh, of trying to, sub to subvert or substitute uh, democratic institutions and procedures. However, this distinction became very uh, idiosyncratic within uh, uh, the the part the. the party politics of Croatia and Serbia, largely as regard of uh, the protracted uh, warfare and uh, the wars of succession in the 1990s. So uh, first, I would like to start with uh, the Serbian Radical Party, one of the oldest uh, part, uh, parties political parties in Serbia, which uh, uh, oscillated between the categories of radical and uh, of ra 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 radical and extremist right wing, a party which that endorsed uh, Greater Serbia and even dispatched a military uh, paramilitary unit to Croatia and Bosnia, the, a, a party that, uh, uh, that had uh, recurring phases of partnership and tension with uh, Slobodan Milosevic's Socialist Party, and uh, still a party that between 2000 and 
2007, uh, bounded together various anti-Western nationalists, for, former voters of uh, Slobodan Milosevic and the SPS, and various other losers of uh, the transition. And therefore, uh, between 2000 and 2007, it was uh, the Serbia's strongest opposition party in its own right. But the turning point was February 2003, when the leader, Vojislav Šešeli, voluntarily surrendered himself to the Hague Tribunal and uh, Tomislav Nikolic, the former Serbian president, and Aleksandr Vucic, the current president of Serbia, became the leading figures within the party. And uh, this is uh, Vojislav Šešeli in the in the pro-Trump uh, rather pro-Trump rally in uh, Belgrade. And uh, however, Nikolic and Vucic soon uh, departed from the Serbian Radical Party and set up the, the Serbian Progressive Party or SNS, a party that put a lower stress on uh, nationalism, formally endorsed the EU accession process, but most importantly, a party that capitalized on the fragmentation among centrist and center right wing parties uh, in Serbia. For example, parties such as the Democratic Party or the, uh, the SPO, the Serbian Re Renewal Movement, and uh, so on. And overall, the SNS also projected a more a softer and more appealing brand of Euroscepticism in comparison to the non compromising and hard Euroscepticism of uh, 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 hard Euroscepticism of uh, the uh, Serbian Radical Party. In a few words, what the former president of uh, Serbia, Tomislav Nikolic, had uh, described as the Balkan foreign policy. And as a result, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Serbian Radical Party won uh, uh, parliamentary and uh, a series of parliamentary and presidential elections since 2016, whereas the Radical Party, the original Radical Party, started to become marginalized. And uh, the SNS consolidated the group to, uh, to, to its grip to power uh, from 2000 uh, in the latest elections of June 2020. It, it is a party that dominates a continuum that stretches from the boundaries of the liberal center all the way to the conservative right, very much relying on uh, the pattern of uh, political uh, clientelism in order to secure uh, support uh, in, a high, in a comparable manner, I would say, as the party of uh, Fidesz in, uh, in Hungary. And uh, uh, and uh, overall, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, this deradicalization, de if I can use literal deradicalization of uh, the of this uh, segment uh, that originated from uh, ra the radical party and then evolved into the Serbian Progressive Party, this very much resulted in the political marginalization of uh, the radical party, who at this given moment is not even uh, uh, represented. That the narrow Skupština, or which is the Serbian Republican Parliament. And here I have some, uh, I would like to refer to some extra parliamentary parties of the extreme, of the radical and extremist uh, party, uh, extremist right in uh, Serbia. One of them is the, uh, the traditionally uh, Serbian nationalist party of uh, Dveri uh, under the, leader, the leadership of uh, Boško Obradovic. Then uh, another one is the Serbska Aksia, which has a clearly national, national socialist uh, uh, platform and uh, draws much of its inspiration from the homegrown fascist tradition, for example, Dmitry Jotic from the interwar era. Then we have some very peculiar hybrid cases, for example, Leviathan, who blend elements from national socialism with uh, animal rights, activism, and uh, anti-vax conspiracy theories. Now moving to Hungary, uh, sorry, to Croatia, another very uh, comparable party to the radical party is the Croatian Party of Rights or HACP, again a party that uh, endorses Greater Croatia, a party that has been uh, uh, accused of historical revisionism, and a party that has also had also dispatched its paramilitary units to the uh, wars of succession in uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, but uh, this is also, but by contrast, the Serbian Radical Party, uh, this party saw a phase of declining popularity during the uh, 2000s. Uh, it, it tried to get back into, into action be, uh, between 2012 and to, to, uh, 2012 and 2014, when first it uh, coordinated the protests against the public use of the Serb Cyrillic script in Eastern Slavonia, and especially the town of uh, Vukovar on the border with uh, Serbia, and also 
uh, between 2013 and 2014 when it joins Catholic uh, church NGOs in uh, demonstrations for the protection of Christian mar marriage and family values. But this party has not been represented in uh, the Croatian parliament or Sabor for years and currently only controls two opcine or mun municipalities in Croatia. And here is a co commemorative plaque of the of the of the uh, of that uh, Hasepe uh, dedicated to its uh, uh, paramilitary, paramilitary unit. Uh, this also uh, it, it also uh, you can also uh, read the Ustashe uh, slogan Zadom uh, Spremni, uh, ready for the homeland. Uh, a commemorative plaque and a monument which is uh, in the vicinity of the Jasenovac uh, concentration camp in Western Slavonia. But uh, here again, we have us in Serbia, there was a process of uh, reformation as the Croatian Democratic Union uh, started uh, consolidating its, uh, its uh, status. And uh, between 2012 and 2016, the, uh, Tomislav Karamarko, who was the leader of the party, uh, he, uh, he promoted the selective reappropriation of certain elements from uh, the, uh, the era of Franjo Tuđman, who, who was a more uh, the founder of uh, independent Croatian Republic and also the founder of HDZ and a nationalist uh, politician. And so therefore this consolidated uh, uh, th this consolidated the status of the right-wing faction within HDZ, uh, a faction that as early as the 2000s was discreetly critical over the EU, the pressures of the EU uh, regarding cooperation with the Hague Tribunal and also the situation of minority, the improvement of minority rights in, uh, in uh, Croatia. And uh, also between 2012 and 2016, this uh, right-wing faction uh, also displayed elements of socio-cultural euroscepticism uh, with a specific focus on opposition to the rights for sexual minorities, uh, abortion, opposition to abortion, and also, and also to a certain extent opposition to the EU refugee quotas since 2015. And uh, this, uh, th th this, uh, uh, th this political engagement of the right-wing faction between the, the ruling party of HDZ decisively marching analyze the forces of the Croatian uh, radical and extremist party, for example, the HACP or the Croatian uh, Pure Party of Rights or the, Octonum, the, or the Autochthonous uh, Croatian Party of Rights. I can, speak, I can uh, provide some more information about them uh, in, during the, dis the discussion. And so uh, here, there is, it is the, here, this is one of the uh, NGOs, uh, the Uime Obitel, in the name of the family that, uh, co uh, that uh, uh, co cooperated with, uh, with, uh, 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 with uh, uh, HACP in, this, in the demonstra demonstrations against, uh, public dem demonstrations against uh, uh, the LGBT uh, rights. And uh, uh, just like SNS in uh, Serbia, HDZ has consolidated its grip to power following the parliamentary elections of July 2020 in Croatia. Again, a party that largely relies on political cl clientelism and a countrywide network of supporters in the public sector for its support. And uh, as, as previously mentioned, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the political engagement of the right-wing faction within the party has been of piv pivotal significance in order to maintain the cohesion of its uh, target groups and supporters, especially in the more socially conservative uh, uh, layers of uh, the electorate, for example, in regions such as uh, Dalmatia and uh, Slavonia. But uh, there has also been a new party that emerged to the right of uh, HDZ. This is the Domovinsky Pokret or the Homeland Movement, which is currently the third uh, largest party of the Croatian uh, parliament, led by Miroslav Škoro, a former singer and TV host. Now this, is, uh, this party endorses a national conservative agenda, which is uh, very, very much comparable to that endorsed by the right-wing faction within HDZ. For example, uh, a stress on Catholic values against abortion, opposing immigration uh, for law and order and also trying to revise the uh, 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 aiming at revising the state legislation minority rights especially as uh, especially as far as the ethnic uh, serb uh, uh, community is concerned and this is the gradual emergence of uh, domovinsky pokret poses a double challenge first to the endeavors by the prime minister and leader of hdz to uh, allegedly uh, move the party narrative of Hadeze more towards the center. And at the same time, the, uh, the, the dynamic emergence of Domovinsky Pokret uh, 
Carter marginalizes the older and more traditional parties of the Croatian radical and extremist right. And this is Miroslav Skoro from one of his older in one of his older uh, albums. And so just a few my final remarks. First, the de-radicalization in the case of uh, Serbia or the long-term trans transformation processes in the case of uh, Croatia of larger mainstream parties of the conservative right, for example, SNS and HDZ can uh, uh, did sideline the 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 more the parties of the more, uh, more radical and extremist right in both uh, contexts in Croatia and Serbia, and uh, with specific regard to the case of uh, Croatia, the emergence of the homeland movement has uh, uh, may may offset even further this balance as it is a party that uh, antagonizes both the right wing faction uh, faction of HDZ and also the political forces of the radical and extremist right. So with this older photo from Pula in Istria in Croatia, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your comments and questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Vasilis. It was really very interesting. And you introduced a very interesting uh, concept, the neo-euro-Asianism. It is an <laughs> interesting term. So I hope that after that, uh, during the discussion, you could develop it. Okay. Uh, so because time mm. is um, uh, uh, running quickly, and now it is a time for Czech Republic, the country which is all time on the uh, um, uh, in the head of uh, all indexes in democracy index, uh, uh, media freedom index. Okay, uh, so welcome, Miroslav. Uh, mm -hmm. It is a time for you, and we will uh, topic comparison of authoritarian and populist tendencies in the Czech Republic uh, and uh, Slovakia. Welcome. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for nice welcoming, and I try to also share my screen. Mm -hmm. You see it now? No. Yes. No. No. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes I'm sorry. Okay, so yes, yeah. yes. Okay, yes. so now I try to enlarge <laughs> it now. Great. So thank you. Uh, I don't know if I should be proud that I'm from the country, which is on the head of your uh, research uh, the, uh, research ranking. So thank you for this. And I, uh, how despite this fact that the Czech Republic maybe is... Uh, Consider relatively well in comparison with some other Eastern East Central European countries in this uh, uh, comparison of democracy. Despite this fact, also the Czech Republic uh, and Slovakia, both countries, challenge to the populist wave. And uh, we can deal with this, this phenomenon also in this both countries. I took this picture to my camera during the monitoring of the rally uh, organized by the Czech uh, Populist Party, or well, Populist Movement. We have the difference between party and movement, but in fact, it's the same freedom and direct democracy, which was. Uh, uh, which was organized in Prague before the European elections in 2019. And at the time, the leader of the Czech Populist Party, Tomio Okamura, this is this specific name I would like to deal later, uh, he invited also important persons from the from the European far right, including Herr Wilders or, or Jean-Marie Le Pen. Uh, Marine Le Pen, I'm sorry, Jean-Marie Le Pen. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting. Also, Jean-Marie Jean Le Pen, he also has a strong ties to the, to the Czech extreme right, but now I'm talking about Marine Le Pen. I'm sorry for this. Uh, and uh, among others, uh, the, 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 uh, the meeting took part also representatives of, of the Slovak party. We are family uh, because both these parties these are in in the in European structure. So so only the explanation why I use this picture because it's 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 connection between the Czech, European, and Slovak uh, populist uh, populist uh, rightness. However, I would like to use the relatively broader concept of populism in this uh, in this paper because if we are talking about populism in both this, uh, both these successor countries of, of Czechoslovakia, we we, of course, we can see strong impact of the populist far right. Uh, thank you also for Vasilis for, for this for this previous division between the right-wing extremism and right-wing populism, because I'm using something similar. However, if we really want to understand these populist tendencies in, in mostly in the Czech Republic and partially in Slovakia, we should define also other forms of extremism. Uh, and, I'm sorry, and the forms of populism. Uh, and that's that should be centrist populism, left-wing populism. And then we can deal mo uh, mostly in the Czech Republic also with this left-wing extremism, 
which includes also populist elements. So generally, we can see very old stream of populism with significant overlaps. In this extreme spectrum, both on the right, both on the right -wing extremism as well as in the left, left -wing extremism, we can see uh, we can we can identify strong authoritarian legacies in the extreme spectrum and authoritarian legacies of the previous development of authoritarian and totalitarian regimes on the Czech and Slovak territory, among other communes, Czechoslovakia, the Slovak state between 1939 to 1945, etc. Uh, what is also important to mention is this, this is really dynamic development of populism in both Excuse countries. Excuse me, Miroslav. Excuse me, Miroslav. Yeah, it is again, a again, only this one, okay, again, only this one screen, yeah? Okay, so so okay. now it's better, yeah? Okay, I will use I will use this civil way. So thank you for for interruption because because yes, there's probably there are some difficulties with this. this, this uh, okay, so I will use only this maybe this smaller version of of my presentation, but I think it's it's not so important. So just due to the fact that I have only ten minutes or fifteen minutes for presentation, I would like to maybe uh, only state that we can we can we can see really this dynamic development i can deal maybe mostly with recent situation because because to identify all all development stages of the pop, of populism in the post communist era it's it's it, it can take hours or or or, or days if we can see the here uh what is also important we can see strong problem of partisan party political populism that's also the most important topic of our today's session but please don't forget that we can see also the strong role of populism in 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 the part of media scene including mostly the so-called this info this information scene or something like this and sometimes we can see also relatively strong uh Individual uh, actors of populism, maybe we, we can we can subsume under this category or also the recent Czech president Miloš Zeman. We can see also 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 some non-partisan actors active in 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 public space. Recently, it's 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 this still is important challenge the so so called anti-vax movement or anti mass movement. But I would like to conclude also with uh, this it's questionable questionable future. So, because this 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 contribution is really maybe only brief overview of the situation due to the due to the due to the relatively limited time, I would like to maybe mention that this this recently the rising extremism in the Czech Republic is relatively weak at the party if we are looking to the uh, into the party political scene. Yeah, uh, this we have we have some 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 small groupings. We have this this uh, this interconnection with this anti-vax movement. We can see some some pro Kremlin groupings, strong list of strong pro Kremlin groupings now also active during the crisis, etc. But but recently, rising extremism with hardliners, they do not they do not have parliamentary uh, representation. On the other hand, we have now relatively strong. Uh, uh, it means that it's relatively strong. It means that this party has some impact on on public public discussions in the Czech Republic, thanks to the parliamentary re uh, representation. And this is a specific movement called Freedom and Direct Democracy. This is a, this is this interesting evaluation. This SPD is is the same like the German Social Democracy, but it isn't the German. German, uh, German social democracy is a Czech, Czech SPD, and even more, uh, even more uh, paradoxical situation is this that it is maybe anti-migrant party, and it is led by Tomio Okamura. And if you see uh, see this name, he's half Japanese, he's half Czech and half, half Japanese, and he is this 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 maybe a little paradoxical situation in the Czech Republic because the leader of the of the strongest anti-migrant party is 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 is, is partially from Japan, yeah, but. But uh, independently, and, and paradoxically, sometimes this party uses also some pan-Slavist uh, apples. May may say not so, not so strongly, but 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 it's it's, it's also interesting that that he is, for, for example, strongly anti-Sudeten German party. It is, for example, because due to the historical legacies. Yeah, so that's that's a lot of paradoxes. Recently, they also they have maybe now the strongest strongest pro-Kremlin position in the in the parliamentary spectrum. If we if we if we analyze the situation of recent days. So they received in last election in, in October 2021, they received uh, uh, nine percent, uh, nine and a half percent of votes. And then this was maybe the biggest challenge if we want to talk about recent populism in the Czech Republic is the is the is the is the evaluation or the assessment or 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 cut or character uh, or characteristics of the of the ano party ano it means it, it is evaluation but in translation it means yes ano it means in Czech Czech, Czech language yeah, yes. And this is the strongest party in the contemporary parliament. 
This is a party which is a member of the liberal structures at the European level, but in fact, it's maybe one man party. And my colleagues, colleagues Loshek, Kopeček, and Vodova, they use for, for labeling of this party the, the term entrepreneurial party, because, because this party is totally depend on one entrepreneur, uh, Andrei Babish. He's among others also import, uh, member, uh, owner of important newspapers, despite the relatively strong freedom of, of, of uh, press in the, in, in the Czech Republic. That, that's, that's, uh, that's a huge challenge. Recently, this party's opposition, however, uh, Andrei Babish was the previous Prime Minister of the Czech Republic, and this party is, seems to be relatively influential still. Uh, then, then relatively weak Latin populism, and what was there also uh, also something special for the Czech Republic in comparison with other East Central European countries? It was a long time the strong role of the Communist Party of Bohemia and Moravia, non-reform, in fact, left the extremist party. This party, however, failed first time after the after the post in the post-communist period. They didn't get the parliamentary representation in domestic parliament, in domestic uh, House of Deputies. However, they still have they still have one member of the European Parliament, but. Let's Recently, we can see the, the, the decline of the, of the impact of the, of the strong party from this, from this, from this post-communist period. If you look to the Slovakia, on the other hand, in, in, in contrast to the Czech Republic, we can see a relatively strong party uh, with really, and they are really the so-called hardliners within the far right extreme spectrum. Already, Vasilis uh, uh, said something about this party because they, they are really. Uh, they are really rooted in this in this in this maybe neo-fascist movement despite some moderation in, in last years maybe but still still the origin of the party is closely connected with this with this with this subcultural subcultural environment etc uh, they 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 receive they receive uh, 8% of votes in 2020. However, last year, some members of the party split, split it from the split from this, from this, uh, from this Kotleba's party. It's, uh, it's really the, the, the official name of the party. Kotleba's People's Party, our Slovakia. Kotleba is a leader, and Kotleba's, it means there are, are supporters of Kotleba. Also, Kotleb, Kotlebovci, when I say it in Slovak language, Kotlebovci, uh, Kotlebovci Ludová strana naše Slovensko. Now, now it was for, for Slavic speaking uh, colleagues, they, it can be maybe more understandable. I'm sorry for, for the others. Uh, to the others, I'm sorry. Uh, so then, then we can see also the party which may be national conservative. This party we are family. This is a, this is a partners party of the of the SPD in this in, in this European structure. They are now governmental party. Or, or, or this party we are family again. It is closely connected with one person, with Boris Boris Kolar against the entrepreneur, important entrepreneur in Slovakia. And also we can we can subsume under this category the extra parliamentary Slovak National Party. And they receive three percent in in elections, not 2000, 2021. I'm sorry, but 2020. It's it's my it's 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 wrong. Uh, it's, it's my fault. I'm sorry. Yeah. So then, then we have question if, if we can subsume some something under the centrist populism. Maybe several parties. Maybe you know. Maybe maybe it's 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 uh, it's a uh, uh, empty space in Slovakia. It depends on on definition. Uh, however, you can see relatively strong loving populism, despite the fact that the party smear it means something like orientation. Social democracy is a member of the socialist. Uh, international structures and European Social Democratic Party or Party of European Socialists, uh, they, 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 they can be subsumed under this form, under this uh, category of, of loving populism. However, uh, they received 18% they receive, uh, of votes in 2020. Recently, however, they, they, they are weakened due to the fact that one split party, uh, new party, is, is stronger than, than, than this smear. So uh, recently they are in opposition. What is what is in Slovakia? We, it's it's, it's a, a non-partisan scene. Maybe that, that this specific category of extremism can be occupied by one person. Who, this is a very important um, deputy uh, deputy uh, of this of this smear party, Luboš Blaha, and he is well known due to due to his sympathies to some left wing extreme extremist entities. So if I should compare and conclude, uh, we can see the strongest position of centrist populism in the Czech Republic and loving populism in, in, this, in Slovakia. I'm sorry, he's, uh, he's uh, again my mistake. So I rewrite you before your eyes. Yeah. 
Yeah, so now it's correct. I'm sorry for my mistake. So, so, so let me pause in Slovakia. We can see we can see relatively strong right-wing populism in both countries, despite the fact that this that they, they, it's, uh, the, the, the ideological position of both uh, and background of both parties is a little bit different. If I compare the SPD and and Smerodina, uh, then we can see strong right-wing extremism in the Czech Republic. Uh, in in his against i'm sorry he, he, i i don't know what's happened but i have hit another mistake so so we can see in slovakia strong driving extremism i'm really really sorry i don't know why i was blind probably uh not in not in the czech republic so i'm sorry and uh, i'm sorry for this and uh, after successful era of living extremism, we can see decline now also in the Czech Republic. And we can see also maybe transfer of these traditional authoritarian parties with this link to authoritarian and totalitarian regimes in the in the in, in this tragical era of the 20th century. We can see now probably decline of these parties and the rise of this new of this new populism. Uh, what is also important to mention that the spectrum, this populist extreme and extremist spectrum in both countries is relatively unstable. We can see the rise and, 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 and fall many new subjects in, for example, we can, we can identify in the, in the development uh, of last uh, 10 or 20 years. Uh, last two years we saw also the, the strong interconnection with this anti-vax movement i took this picture also in my home city brno during one rally of the anti-vax movement however among among the participants is for example leader of one of this czech uh arriving extremist party relatively unimportant workers party of social justice uh, but uh, and that's that's maybe symbolize this this interconnection between far right and this anti-vax movement but uh, it's could be challenge what's going to be in the future especially in this post covid era after the maybe after this party maybe you can see that they can lose this 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 relatively well uh, relatively popular topic however we are now in storm stormly uh, era we don't know what's happened with, with the war in ukraine and and the uh, wave of uh, wave of uh, refugees etc it can be again full for some of this rival populist rival extremist party for example this spd party now uh, you know, now yesterday published one one strong attack against the against the acceptance of, of migrants. So 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 still we have this, we, we we are real. I don't know. Unfortunately, we live in such difficult era, and uh, it can be also from the scientific point of view, it can be interesting from the point of view of research, populism and authoritarian tendencies. Thank you for your attention. Oh. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Uh, so we have exactly 30 minutes only for our discussion, but uh, it was really very interesting presentation. They were very interesting presentation because now I discovered that we have uh, some important uh, uh, concept, populism, and what about difference with authoritarian populism, centrist mm -hmm. populism, Okay, right, uh, right uh, wing uh, populism. We have uh, uh, neo euro, -Asi uh, euro asianism uh, They are a new categories, uh, very important, I think, in the context of our um, uh, in, in our panel. Okay, so I think that now it is a time for uh, for a question. Maybe uh, somebody from the uh, participant would like to ask uh, our um, uh, uh, presenters. If not, uh, uh, I don't see. I would like to ask a question. Yes, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much for these uh, interesting presentations. And I hope uh, we will have a fruitful discussions in the, this Q&A session. My question is uh, for Professor Mroslav Mares, the last uh, panelist. Uh, you know, the, for the past decade, populists like Andrei Babis have often seemed politically invincible or undefeatable. However, okay. last autumn, a wide range of political parties in the Czech Republic could come together, despite their all differences, to oppose the populist prime minister Babis. Do you think that Babis' defeat, which followed the defeat of Donald Trump in the United States, suggests that the populist wave is receding, stalled by the growing unity of its opponents, 
What lessons should be opposition parties in the countries under illiberal autocracies like Turkey, Hungary, Poland, etc. take from this experience in Czech Republic? Could opposition parties and groups in these countries hope to duplicate the feed? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, maybe it, it is uh, better to answer for this question. Miroslav, could you answer? Okay, thank you very much. If I if I can answer right now, so thank you for this excellent question. Because uh, okay, I can now start with the comparison of Babish and 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 Trump. Because really, for example, Babish used some motifs from the Trump campaign. For example, it had this, this "Make Czechia Strong Again," etc. It, it was used also by Babish, and they have they have maybe similar similar entrepreneur background at uh, both. And and Babish also visited Trump, and for him it was it was uh, maybe. Be proud to be to be accepted as a partner by Trump, uh, and, uh, and uh, I fully agree that, that 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 this may be this this strong coalition against Babish, strong strong and also a huge coalition in the in in the sense of number of participants of this coalition because recently our government consists of uh, four parties and one of this one of this no. It consists of six parties because because the one one of this of this subject is coalition consists of three parties so we have really broad part of political spectrum against Babish and Okamura so so that's a, that's that's now the recent situation and what can be what can be maybe for what can be for Babish okay Babish was a, a newcomer into the politics in 2011 and then since 2013 he was still the the, the winner of, of so not, not not the winner of election in the sense of numbers, for example, uh, uh, or in the votes, because he he got uh, he was third in he was second in the in the 2013. But still, he he, he maybe we can identify this ano movement at, uh, on the maybe uh, on the growing. Yeah. So, on the other hand, recently uh, we can see this decline of the power of Babish. But we do not have we do not have surveys about about the real popularity of the ano. He is not down. He has he has the strongest. The ano still has the strongest strongest club in the or, or parliamentary faction. Still 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 they are strongest. They 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 still are popular uh, in public. And what is maybe important? <laughs> I'm, I'm, Babish is younger than Trump, yeah. Babish still has chance that he can turn to the office, yeah. So, so, and now he tried to he tried to candidate was also was 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 also an important driver of his of his recent activity. We have also presidential election in the Czech Republic, and the Czech Republic is directly elected president, and he tries to be president in, in now because we this presidential election we have next year, and uh, so so maybe that he can be elected president and that's that's for that's for him another chance what is also maybe i, I can mention this paradox here yeah, because he because babish is slovak origin yeah so so that's 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 <laughs> that's that's, 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 that's yeah. paradox that's really yeah during his during his first year i was an interesting situation when the prime minister was a slovak the the, the mayor of prague was slovak origin and also some ministers were slovak origin it was it was really really <laughs> slovak rule over the czech republic but despite despite this fact is he is very popular it's uh, try to imagine the situation in post yugoslavia area if the serbian politic someone uh, who holds the serbian nationality and, and serbian citizenship could be could be uh, prime minister of croatia or, or or, or president of Croatia, I try to imagine the situation. Yes, so that's, a, that's the problem. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, who would like to ask? Okay. Yes, welcome. Uh, hello. Uh, just, uh, do, do you hear me? Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for these thought provoking speeches. Uh, today, I cannot help myself, but ask a question in connection to the Russian aggression towards Ukraine. Uh, indeed, Russian military attack made me think on the influence of this aggression on the internal politics of Balkan countries, especially of Serbia, considering its uh, multi-ethnic population. And we all know that Balkans region has been an area of rivalry between Europe and Russia throughout history. 
and we know that this is not an outdated issue at all. Just I'd like to hear your views on to what extent would Russia-Ukraine issue further feed populist nationalist rhetoric in the region? Uh, my question is, I think, to Vasilis. Vasilis, welcome. Thank you for your kind question. Well, I think that it is very personally, uh, I would like to differentiate here between the management of ethnic relations and foreign policy, because I think that uh, uh, when it comes to, uh, well, recently I have just uh, completed my second monograph, which very much deals with these uh, aspects. And uh, I think that when it comes to, uh, I think that the most important aspect here is uh, if you think of the case of Serbia, a, a country that uh, has been uh, I mean, uh, under the current government uh, has been sitting in three chairs, not three stolice, as it is, as it is in uh, in Serbian, meaning that uh, it has been trying to to uh, uh, to uh, to balance between uh, uh, between uh, the Euro Atlantic uh, Euro Atlantic alliances and Russia. But uh, uh, for for example, uh, for for example. Serbia does not uh, re uh, the, uh, recognizes uh, Serbia recognizes Crimea as part of Ukraine, but at the same time, the Serbian government did not vote for uh, uh, economic sanctions against uh, Russia. But now there is going to be a very serious uh, pressure on uh, uh, on uh, Serbian government about which side is on this. Uh, this I expect these pressures to intensify. Uh, uh, now, when it comes in another question that uh, that emerges is in uh, the question of uh, Republika Srpska and Miroslav Dodik, Dodik this centrifugal tendency in uh, in Bosnia and how uh, and how uh, and to what developments may be there and so then again uh, another issue is when it comes to also i mean I can, uh, for for example, the case of Kosovo, because uh, uh, Ukraine has not recognized the independence of Kosovo, and now again, if there are any uh, any realignments as, as a result of the recent uh, of uh, Russia's invasions, uh, Russia, of the Russian invasion, then we don't know how this is going to all these geopolitical balances, how they're going to be affected. Okay, too much. I wouldn't like to make any predictions. It's not in my habit to make predictions, but I would like to to to, pre to present a, br a broader overview. Thank you so much. I know it's 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 too early to talk one, but uh, still, uh, I think we'll see the um, it influences in uh, in 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 the midterm. Let's say, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, because I don't know the correct pronunciation. Dejan, 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 uh, please <laughs> welcome. No problem at all. It's there. It's there. And greetings from Canada, actually. I'm listening to your talk from Canada. And I also have a question for Vasilis. Uh, he was focusing on right wing populism in Serbia, Croatia, but uh, I also focus on the same region. And I'm curious if he can interpret what is happening in terms of the left-wing populism, particularly in Serbia, the rise on environmental movement, especially now when we have elections, but also what is happening in the last several years, the mainstream opposition parties, our mainstream opposition, former liberal democratic, democratic center, but everything they do is from the actually populist book in a way how they try to undermine which is uh, power. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dayan, for your question. And I think that if I, if I have to speak about uh, uh, more uh, about the coalition of Moramo or uh, Nedavimo Belgrad, before that, I think that first of all, I, uh, I will have to speak of Mojemo and uh, Zagreb and Ash. Uh, quali uh, the, the Mojemo is currently it is it is currently a fourth uh, the fo the fourth uh, largest party at the, at the Croatian Parliament, and uh, the uh, what were platform that don't want to define themselves as a party and uh, also most importantly uh, currently the mayor of uh, 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 the mayor of uh, of uh, Zagreb Tomashevic has been elected from uh, Mojemo and uh, Mojemo is not exactly a populist uh, left wing populist party but it includes this element uh, also and uh, that now this also in, this encouraged a certain uh, a, a, another grouping uh, a grouping in uh, Serbia uh, uh, 
moramo and uh, 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 možemo means we can, moramo we must, and uh, which is very much organized along the same lines as uh, as uh, as uh, možemo in Croatia. And uh, now it is uh, uh, this is a very timely and good uh, question by Dejan because uh, there have been these massive uh, protests in uh, Serbia against Rio Tinto uh, investment and uh, the potential and uh, and uh, the uh, very environmentally hazardous investment that would be. And so there were mass protests. And I think that this can provide, so we'll have to wait and see, but I think that this definitely provides a good uh, a good uh, ground for grassroots opposition of this sort in Serbia and the emergence of a more up-to-date variant of, uh, of an um, umbrella uh, movement, which uh, uh, contains elements of left-wing populism, but also env env environmentalists and other activists. And uh, now when it comes to the centrist parties, uh, well, uh, during the last election, uh, the last presentation elections in, Ju in June 2020, uh, uh, Gilas, uh, 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 the leader of uh, the of the of uh, of uh, centrist of the Demokratska Stranka, the centrist party, they try to to copy certain of these elements uh, from this the populist book uh, and try to organize to organize this uh, uh, an umbrella opposition uh, comprising parties as diverse as Dveri that I present spoke to er about uh, earlier as and then even uh, parties uh, from the radical uh, left. But uh, I think that the main problem is first, uh, however, they try to rely on this. Uh, populist cookbook, it is the lack of coherence. And I think that another problem is that when it comes to death, uh, Demokratska Stranka in particular, is this uh, uh, legacy, this uh, still these memories of uh, uh, of uh, corruption uh, during the last time that they were in uh, government. So I'm not so I'm not very optimistic about centrist, the pro prospects for centrist opposition in Serbia. But uh, it will be interesting to see what happens with uh, uh, initiatives like uh, Moramo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I see that Erkan would like to, uh, to, 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 to ask. Welcome. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, so my question is going to Professor Adam about Hungary. So um, in one of your people, if, you are, if I remember correctly, so you are talking about the economic populism as well. So the liberal politics may be also seeing the source of the populism in Hungary. Uh, and the, one of these interesting parties is that the urban, urban regime or urban governments, they conceptualize many new Marxist terms, for example, uh, to a kind of backlash to the, these neoliberal policies, whatever, I don't know, actually, I, I, I couldn't def define exactly how to define. Um, so my, my question is, is, is there a kind of nostalgia, nostalgia a feeling for the past, for the communist past in Hungary, um, that provocated, that discovered, rediscovered by the urban regime that they put in emphasis. This is one question. And the second question is, this policy is it, doesn't create a kind of reaction, reaction coming from the people who already suffer from this communist regimes. Because Hungary is a good example for the transition from communism to the liberal policies. And nowadays we see really a, a bad experience now with the authoritarianism. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's true. Welcome, uh, Zoltan. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Erka, for the question. So what I try to make a point about the importance of social inclusion in the construction of a populist project. And I think what uh, Mr. Orman does is, is a kind of strange uh, technique of social inclusion. It's a, it's a kind of selective social inclusion. And to, to some extent, I think it's similar to peace in, in, in the Polish case. Peace is probably more uh, general uh, social inclusion, what it pursues, but it's, it's also kind of a selective inclusion as we could, we could hear uh, in, in today's presentation, uh, inclusion or, or, or benefits for the good Polish families and, and show social chauvinism at the same time towards the, the non that not, not that good ones. So in, in some sense, the, the Hungarian, the Hungarian uh, uh, practice of, of social inclusion benefits provided for the losers, uh, or actually not that much losers of transition is similar in the Hungarian case. 
those who merit, those who are good enough to judge to be good enough can be supported. But this is mostly middle-class families in the, in the Hungarian case. Uh, and it goes against actually the previous practice of left-wing, if you like, economic populism before Mr. Orban's tenure, before 2010, which was conducted by the socialist, the, the post-communist socialist left in Hungary, which did pursue a kind of economic populist agenda, a much broader sense of social inclusion, which was, however, judged to be not, not sufficient, particularly at the time of the crisis in 2008, 9, 10, uh, when, the, when the global financial crisis had very strong repercussions in, in Hungary. And this is the moment when, when Mr. Orban gets to be elected with his first to third majority in, in, in parliament. So it's a kind of mixed bag. Uh, Mr. Orban does mobilize some sort of uh, nostalgia for social safety, for security. For instance, he cuts uh, utility prices, uh, which, is, which is a politically important, not only economically, but also in a symbolic sense. He wages a war against global capitalism. Uh, he nationalizes some industries. And, and he, he makes this, this selection of the good Hungarian families and th those who merit, those, those who are worth of being supported and those who are not that much worth of, for instance, the Roma uh, tend to be not that much worth of being supported. Although I wouldn't say that there's an openly racist conduct of social policies, but many social policy techniques actually do prefer Hungarian non-Roma middle-class families and the Poor, typically poorer uh, Roma families with more kids are, are, are not preferred by, by social policies. Thank you. So I don't see uh, other question. Uh, 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 Bullet, welcome. Actually, there is a question in chat. Uh, if you ask or read, uh, it is uh, uh, for uh, Vasily. Uh, may I can read uh, one of our uh, intern uh, ask a question for Vasilis Petsinis uh, since he she is in library so she cannot talk uh, so she apologize and the question is what would be your policy recommendations to combat euroscepticism in Serbia and Croatia? Yes, I just read it. I just read it right now. Well, I don't know. I'm done. I cannot really make any uh, any policy recommendations as such <laughs> but, uh, but I can explain what are the reasons uh, for that what are the reasons for that that uh, in uh, in Croatia in Serbia I have to say the uh, uh, Serbian uh, euroscepticism is very much has a very much geopolitical component which is which is very much dependent on this uh, the official uh, the concept of Balkan foreign policy as Tomislav Nikolic uh, outlined it outlined it and this 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 attempt to attempt to balance and oscillate between uh, West and East, uh, uh, Euro-Atlantic institutions, and on the other hand, Russia, and most recently China also, in trying to extract as much as many benefits as possible for Serbia from this uh, oscillation. And this is pretty much uh, what fuels. Uh, of course, now, we'll, as I mentioned, we'll see how much this is likely to be, uh, this, balance is, uh, this balancing is going to be offset following the recent developments in Ukraine. But this is very much what feeds Euroscepticism in, uh, in Serbia, in my opinion, I think that uh, uh, Serb the Serbian Euroscepticism is primary, the dominant version is uh, geopolitical, politically, ideologically conservative and right wing. Then again, uh, you also have, uh, and, th and then when it comes to Croatia, Croatia, the situation is uh, somewhat uh, different because in Croatia, uh, the Euroscepticism can also, the Euroskeptic trends can also be linked with uh, opposition to the EU, uh, to the EU for the improvement of minority rights, also in position to the EU EU or the, uh, for the management for the for the for the improvement of the rights of sexual minorities. So again, you have this right wing uh, uh, right wing conservative element. Uh, perhaps even uh, when it comes to the socio cultural dimension of uh, Euroscepticism. But then again, another aspect is that uh, there there may be also some fertile ground for the emergence of more left wing versions of uh, Euroscepticism in Croatia, largely as a result of uh, of brain drain and uh, persistent uh, uh, problematic private privatization and uh, and uh, 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 urban rural discrepancies and 
emigration abroad. So, and so I think, and this is something that the party of uh, the party called uh, Human Blockade, GVZ, uh, touched upon uh, a party that uh, was, uh, very, was structured according to the pattern of the Five Star Movement in Italy. Uh, now they disappeared, but uh, also Moshimo tries to, in a more uh, Moshimo, although it's I couldn't call them Eurosceptic, but they they are very pro. Uh, they, 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 they are pro-welfare and so they can be, they, they have this Euro-alternativist Euro vision, so to speak. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, more questions? More questions? No. So, uh, because we have 10 minutes more for discussion, so well, maybe... A, well, uh, if there is no question, I have a question for uh, Dominica. Yes. May I? Dominica. I mean, of course. Okay, now okay. it's okay. Thank you very much. Uh, as you know, uh, the Poland is now building a wall uh, along its Belarus border, as Slovenia and Hungary uh, did along their own borders with Croatia. What do you think about the policy of build, building walls on borders? Do you feel that this policy, which is followed by numbers of populist governments in Europe, including Law and Justice Party in Poland, is extremely prot protectionist? Isn't this policy against the European Union ideals such as free movement of people, service and goods, protecting environment, preserving nature and wildlife across Europe? And also taking the recent Polish case into your considerations, do you see any direct or indirect correlations between building walls on the borders and illiberal policies followed by authoritarian populist regimes on a wide range of issues? Thank you. Welcome, Dominica. It is time for you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the question. And, uh, uh, what to say when we think of a populist mindset, uh, it equals to us, to the dichotomic um, vision of the world. And I believe that building up the walls or the fences, as it is in case of Poland at this moment, it's a, a very sad embodiment of this concept, uh, the theory that is uh, uh, unintentionally even put into practice. I mean, this mindset, the black and, uh, and white and us versus the others. Um, you asked about the relation or interlinkage between uh, this aspect of the current Polish uh, foreign affairs and the European Union. As you know, this dance macabre between the Polish government and the uh, European Union officials is now been lasting for a while. On one hand, of course, uh, it's, uh, uh, I mean, the membership in the EU is still having the majority of uh, those in favor in the Polish society. On the other hand, European Union, especially the judicial um, uh, institutions, the courts and um, are being seen as uh, one of the biggest threats to the cohesion and uh, efficiency of the ongoing populist radical right reform by the law and justice government. Uh, you uh, were uh, asking about the, the, the defense walls, I mean, the, the walls and the fences at the border um, also in terms of, uh, of the European values and the European, um, let's say, rules. Uh, we all know that uh, European Union itself uh, and I will be very gentle, uh, saying that it presents an ambiguous stance toward the incomers. Uh, we saw it, we experienced it uh, all over the European Union, and it's not different uh, in the Polish case, uh, uh, because I'm active also in the NGO sector uh, and on daily basis we work with the issue of human rights and immigrants and and also uh, the the uh, cultural diplomacy um, um, area 
activities. Uh, I must say that uh, for many reasons, also the European, also the European Union uh, officials' stance was very, um, for me personally, uh, was very disappointing in a sense that. Um, uh, on one hand, of course, the rhetoric is, is uh, let's say, according to the core European values. On the other hand, when you look into the practice, uh, we saw uh, um, the actions taken by the European uh, Union, by the uh, MPs as well, that were actually in line with this very, let's say, uh, um, no, strict and very populist uh, policy of the Polish government when it comes to sorting out the refugee crisis at the Polish at the Polish border. Uh, uh, please, if you can ask me a bit more de detailed question, I will be happy to 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 answer because it was quite a wide area you were referring to. Yeah, thank you. That, uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. And the next question from you. Uh, welcome. Just I have a quick question to Zoltan. I would like to hear your personal view on EU's approach to the rise of uh, authoritarian tendencies uh, in Hungary. Uh, because what I have seen uh, is that EU has been trying to find a balance between solidarity and unity of the union and its democratic aspirations. And there are a lot of criticisms uh, on its approaches. I would like to hear your personal uh, opinion on that. Okay. okay. Welcome. Thanks, Thanks a lot for the question. It's, it's another super interesting question. I think in the EU, there has been a major transformation of, uh, of the policy line towards Hungary and the kind of outlier status of um, of, of the Hungarian government vis-a-vis -vis the, 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 the mainstream EU, EU political stance. The, most recently, Hungary was the, the last country that signed the uh, common EU uh, stance with respect to Russia and Ukraine, just to give you an example. I think one of the major reasons for that was uh, Mr. Orban's role in EPP. So obviously, when Fidesz was a constitutive part of the European People's Party, the, mo the, the strongest and, and as such most important European political party group, then uh, it was a kind of balancing act. It was a kind of a tight rope, a tight rope uh, balancing act between being critical and at the same time keeping Orban within EPP. And once Orban is out of EPP, this, the, the entire situation is different. And now I think the EU uh, quite openly and obviously use him as a, as a threat, uh, as a kind of uh, uh, source of uh, centrifugal tendencies within the uh, within the group, and I think the the most uh, uh, of the effort from the EU now is oriented towards trying to control him and try to punish the Hungarian government, and uh, and try to, uh, to to enforce common European standards on the practice of the Hungarian government now. Okay, thank you. Because I think that we are close to the end. Uh, so uh, if uh, I don't see any questions, uh, so I think that uh, I would like to thank you very, very much, above all for the invitation and for the very interesting uh, uh, presentation. So I hope that now I know more about populism. I know that they are not only populism, but they are authoritarian populism, central, uh, uh, centrist populist, right-wing populism. Uh, so a lot of possibility. So thank you, thank you very much. And I hope that we will be able to meet uh, each other in the other um, occasion.